Is it possible to say anything about fertility rates changing over the past 50 years? Uh, is there any statement you can you can make on that? Yeah, there's some data that seems to suggest that infertility rates are increasing over the last several years. Uh, it's pretty common. I don't know if your listeners know, but about you know the lifetime risk of infertility for each person is about one in six. So that's close to 20 percent. Uh, in the last few years, in the United States, it seems to be kind of a plateau of the prevalence. But as far as the reasons for the increase in infertility prevalence, it's not super well understood. Part of the reason is delayed childbearing. I was just about to say, yeah. you could make it 100% if every woman decides to have a baby when she's 70. By definition, yeah, you have exactly. 100% fertility. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Infertility. Yeah. Yeah. So women are waiting longer, of course, to start their families, to pursue education, career, et cetera. Maybe they haven't found the right partner. And so that definitely is contributing to, to increased rates of fertility. There's some data that show that sperm counts are decreasing globally. It's a little mm -hmm. controversial, but that may be playing a role. Uh, there is, might be a slight increased risk in sexually transmitted diseases as well. So all those things are, are probably factors. But do we know if a 30-year-old woman today has uh -huh. a higher rate of infertility than a 30-year-old woman 50 years ago? We think so, but I don't know that data off the top of my head. I got it. Yeah. And so if the answer there is yes, we would then, I don't know that it would answer all our questions because it could still be explained by decreasing sperm count. It could still be right. explained by increasing paternal age. You know, this, this would be a very right. difficult analysis to do. Right, right. Environmental factors as well. You know, yeah. where our exposures are different now than yeah. they were 50 years ago. Well, and then the question, of course, would be, if this is an environmental reason, mm -hmm. what are the environmental triggers? Right. Now, you mentioned STDs a minute ago. Mm -hmm. So how do STDs and which STDs play a role in fertility? The ones most well understood are probably gonorrhea and chlamydia, which are very common sexually transmitted diseases. And on the female side, those particular infections can ascend to the fallopian tubes and cause scarring in the fallopian tubes, which then interfere with that process that we talked about earlier, the egg and the sperm meeting and can lead to infertility. And is that something that happens if it is left untreated, or is that something that's easy to address with antibiotics if caught early? I mean, if it's caught early, then it's usually treatable with antibiotics, or there are some issues with antibiotic resistance, especially with gonorrhea. But usually if you catch it early, it's treatable. Uh, but if it's late stage or it's unrecognized or untreated, then it has more likely, more likely to ascend to the fallopian tubes where it usually causes fertility problems. How prevalent is gonorrhea today? in the U.S.? I think it's pretty common. I don't know. Really? Yeah. Yeah. In certain populations, it's more common than others. But um, yeah, unfortunately. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, some of it is just lack of awareness and education about, about safe sex practices, um, maybe less testing as well, especially we saw that during the pandemic for sure. How does it present? In women, usually with um, pelvic pain, fever, vaginal discharge, those are the most common symptoms. And is it equally transmissible from male to female and female to male? It's probably more transmissible from male to female. Okay. And is it, is it an STD where the person who has it knows they, like if a male has it, does he know he has it? Not always. Presumably not if it's not being always. transmitted this yeah. readily. Yeah, not always. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about HSV? Does that factor into fertility at all? Uh, not as much, no. Yeah. And chlamydia, again, I apologize for my ignorance. I just don't remember any of this mm -hmm. stuff since uh, taking uh, you know, the, the USMLE <laughs> exams. Yes. Uh, w tell me how chlamydia presents and, and how it impacts fertility. The same, actually. Yeah, very similarly. So pelvic pain, fever, uh, usually they're, they're both present together. Okay. And does it have the same pathology where it creates, it ascends the yep. fallopian tubes and yep. scars the tubes? Yeah. So if, if worst case scenario, if a woman undergoes a severe infection with one or both of these, mm -hmm. um, it's not treated in time, she has completely scarred uh, fallopian tubes, mm -hmm. is it still likely that she could get pregnant through IVF? Are the eggs yes. still general, is the, are the eggs and uterus still preserved enough to Yes, yes. Okay. It doesn't usually affect the uterus or the eggs or the ovaries. Yes. Now, she may not know that she has blocked tubes until she 
starts trying because you wouldn't necessarily feel different if your tubes were blocked. So one of the tests we were talking earlier about, you know, what testing we might do in addition to a semen analysis and getting a menstrual history, et cetera, is we usually do an X-ray test. It's called a hysterosalpingogram or HSG for short. Yep. And it's done specifically to evaluate whether or not the tubes are open. So are you just injecting contrast in you exactly. go you go in I assume you do this externally, you go into the cervix. Uter, into the cervix, into yep. the and you just inject dye and take an X ray. Exactly. And you're looking for how smooth. And so tell me, what does a normal fallopian tube look like on that test? So first the dye, so it's done in radiology facility, usually by radiologists, although some gynecologists do this, this test as well. But usually it fills up the uterus, so you can also see the uterus. And then the tubes are kind of like these wire-like. Yeah. How, what's the diameter of a normal fallopian tube in that setting? Like less than a centimeter. Yeah. That, that's that's pretty big. Yeah, the whole tube, but the, the actual sort of opening no, is yeah. even less than how, how big is the lumen? Microns. Oh, wow. Okay. Or millimeters. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> but you can see it. Definitely see it on yeah. x-ray and you can see Well, if you the, can see it, it's probably a millimeter or more yeah, than not yeah, a micron. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the dye is filling up the tubes and then spilling out the tubes. So you can right. see that The process. ovaries are not visualized because of right. the finger-like projection. So it's actually spilling dye into the peritoneum at this point. Right. Okay. Right. And l based on that visual inspection, a, a trained radiologist and GYN can say that is smooth, that looks great right. versus that is jagged and or obstructed. Right. Now, if it's obstructed, yeah. I assume that the woman has a much bigger problem, which is every month one of those eggs comes out, it's not getting past the point. Right. Does it just atrophy and get reabsorbed? Yeah. I see. So it wouldn't necessarily cause pain. No. So let's say you do the analysis and I assume if you if there's scarring on one side but not the other, would you intervene or would you just say, no, we just have to, it's just going to take twice as long for one to get through? Yeah, there's still a chance to get pregnant. Although whatever process call, caused the scarring in the one tube probably affected the other tube as well. So just, just because it's open yep. doesn't mean that it's functioning normally. Um, Certainly can give give it a few months of trying, but the other issue you have to worry about is uh, what we call an ectopic pregnancy. If that tube is not normal, if fertilization happens, that embryo can implant in the tube, and that's kind of a very dangerous situation because obviously the tube can accommodate a pregnancy. So usually, eventually, that causes pain, and if it goes unrecognized, it's it a could, surgical emergency. Yeah, exactly. At how many weeks of gestation? Is a woman typically, because that's, you know, I did my training in general sure. surgery. So that was one of the things we were always thinking right. about was ectopic pregnancies yeah. for women presenting with abdominal pain. Um, but I don't think I know the answer to this question, which is how many weeks of gestation is a woman when she's showing up in the ER complaining of abdominal pain? Usually about six to eight weeks wow. of pregnancy. Two so, months pregnant. Right. Yeah. Now, remember we time yeah, yeah. <laughs> pregnancy from, from like so, two weeks before yeah. ovulation. So she's, you know, by the time she recognizes she's pregnant, she's already a month pregnant. Yep. So in the next month is probably the most co common time where those ectopic pregnancies present. So when a woman has an ectopic pregnancy, mm -hmm. can that fallopian tube be salvaged? Sometimes. Sometimes if you recognize it early, it can be treated either medically or surgically, and that tube can be salvaged. If you recognize it late and the tube ruptures, then oftentimes the treatment is to just remove the tube, plus especially if it's not functioning normally. To yeah, so with. when you remove that, let's just say it's a young woman, she's 25 years yeah. old, you, you can't salvage the tube, you end up taking the tube, you're leaving the ovary, Right. so you still want her to have her endocrine system intact. Right. What's happening to the eggs that come out of that tube? They just get released into the abdomen, the peritoneum, and resort. So yeah. do you tell that woman your fertility rate just went down by 50%? Kind of. Yeah. 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 She can still get pregnant if she has the other tube in intact. But most of the time, if the egg ovulates from the right, it's going to try and go down the right side. Although there have been cases where... You know, you can ovulate from the right ovary and it can travel it down. It makes its way over to the other fallopian It makes its way tube. over there. Yeah, it's rare. Wow. <laughs> but it could happen. Yeah. Um, what other risks for ecto ecto ectopic pregnancy besides former STDs that lead to scarring in the tube? Uh, previous surgery, pelvic surgery in particular, like a ruptured appendix or something like that. Endometriosis can cause scarring of the tubes. Those are probably the most common. 
I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.